In this video, we're going to look at the spinal cord and we're going to look at how signals move in and out of the spinal cord. And then we're going to look at reflexes. When we are going to cause muscles to contract, we use our brain to think of a plan. We have a motor cortex, which I'll actually explain in more detail in a video specifically about the brain. But there's going to be a part of the motor cortex that is going to send the motor signals down through the spinal cord. When it gets to the spinal cord, it is going to move through a spinal nerve that is going to go out to the muscles of the body to cause contraction. And same with sensory information. We can feel the sensation, for example, touching this phone. And we can send that sensory information back through the spinal nerves to the spinal cord. And then that information will be sent up to the brain to a sensory cortex where we can interpret those sensations. And then we can always make adjustments to our muscle contraction so that we're using the right amount of force in the exact right way. Our fingers and muscles and brain combined have a lot of dexterity. We can do a lot of very intricate things by contracting the exact muscles in the right amount at the right time. So we're going to look at the spinal cord and how that sensory information is coming in and how the motor information is going out. This diagram is just to orient you to where the spinal cord is located with respect to the bones that surround it. So the vertebrae are the bones that protect the spinal cord. As the spinal cord moves down through the center of all of the vertebrae, then the spinal nerves are going to be branching off in between each of the vertebrae. Now, each spinal nerve is going to carry sensory information to the spinal cord and motor information out from the spinal cord to the body. So you can see that the spinal nerves branch and they enter and leave the spinal cord in different ways, and that's what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna zoom in to this spinal cord. So this is a side view or a lateral view, and you can see that the spinal cord has protective connective tissue membranes. The pia mater, arachnoid mater, and dura mater are the meninges that protect the spinal cord. In between each vertebrae, we have discs, and these help to cushion the bones so that we don't feel pain whenever we move. And then over here, we're looking at a cross-section image of the spinal cord. So if you cut your body in half and now you're looking down, this is what our spinal cord cross-section looks like. If you feel your back, you can feel these processes, these transverse and spiny processes. That's the bones that you can feel. So this is the posterior side of your spinal column, and this is the anterior side. So this would be the front sort of facing inside your body, and this is the back. This is what you can feel. When we look at a cross-section, we can see the nerves bringing sensory information in, motor information out, and there's a little layer of fat that also adds added protection, and there's cerebral spinal fluid in here that's bringing nutrients to the spinal cord. So what we're going to do is focus on this part. In the spinal cord, we have gray matter and white matter, just like we do in the brain, gray matter and white matter. There are different cell components that are in each of those. The gray matter contains the cell bodies. So remember the structure of a neuron, right? We have the dendrites and the cell body. We have the axon and axon terminals. So the gray matter is basically everything that looks gray. So the cell bodies, the dendrites, and the axon terminals and then also, if the axon is very short, if it's an interneuron and there's no myelin, then it will look gray. The only thing that is in the white matter component is myelinated axons. That fatty protective layer on myelinated axons looks white. 
when you have bundles of neurons together in the peripheral nervous system, that is a nerve, and when you have bundles of neurons together in the central nervous system, like the spinal cord, that is a tract. So the white matter contains white matter tracts that are carrying information to the brain. In this diagram, there's a lot of information here, but I want to point out a few things. The inside butterfly shape here is our gray matter and different levels of the spinal cord, like the cervical versus thoracic versus lumbar region, for example, this shape might be slightly different in slightly different places, but generally it has this butterfly shape. There's a central canal, which allows cerebral spinal fluid to move through the entire spinal cord. And these are the white tracks or sometimes called white columns. The top of the diagram here is the posterior side and also sometimes called dorsal, like the dorsal fin on a fish. And the front is the anterior side, which is also sometimes called the ventral side. When we look at the spinal nerve, spinal nerves all branch so that we have the sensory information is coming in through the dorsal or posterior side and the motor information is leaving through the ventral or anterior side. The spinal cord where it branches, we call those the roots. So this is the posterior root and this is the anterior root. Let's highlight those. So the posterior and anterior root combine to form the spinal nerve. Once that sensory information has come into the spinal cord, it goes into the gray matter and we call these areas the horns. So this back region is the posterior horn and this front region is the anterior horn. So the horns are inside and the roots are outside. The sensory information is always coming in the posterior or the dorsal side. Now, what's this big bump here? This is where the neuron cell bodies are. Do you remember in a previous video when we looked at the structure of different kinds of neurons and we looked at multipolar, that's a typical motor neuron, we had bipolar where the cell body is in the axon and then we had unipolar where the cell body sticks out from the side of the axon and then also remember that when you have a group of cell bodies together in the peripheral nervous system it's called a ganglion so when we have our sensory neuron cell bodies grouped together they form the posterior root ganglia Okay, this is where all of the cell bodies are. Sensory neuron cell bodies are in the peripheral nervous system, not the central nervous system. Okay, so these cell bodies, sensory cell bodies are in the posterior root ganglion or dorsal root ganglion. The motor cell bodies, they are located in the ventral or anterior horn. The somatic motor cell bodies are in the central nervous system, whereas the somatic sensory cell bodies are in the peripheral nervous system. And then we have autonomic nervous system cell bodies, and they are primarily located in the lateral horns, okay, which is kind of the side of the gray matter. The other thing that I want to point out is where the synapses are. So the sensory information, when it comes into the spinal cord, it is going to synapse onto these small interneurons. And remember, small interneurons do not have myelin and they are part of the gray matter. So a few key things to make sure that you know about, right? White matter versus gray matter. Where's the sensory information coming in? Where is the motor information going out? Where are the sensory cell bodies? And where are the motor cell bodies? And where are the autonomic nervous system cell bodies? Let's just focus on that one aspect of the spinal cord. 
Somatic sensory information is coming into the spinal cord through the dorsal root. The cell bodies are in the dorsal root ganglion. They synapse onto interneurons in the gray matter. Visceral sensory stimuli also comes in through the dorsal root and they will synapse on slightly different interneurons. Visceral means our organs. So we're actually not super great at detecting visceral sensory stimuli. You can kind of tell if your stomach is full, but you can't really determine if your small intestine or your large intestine has some kind of a problem. Somatic sensory information and visceral information all come in through the posterior or dorsal root, and they all synapse on interneurons that will then also synapse with neurons in the white matter tracts that will send information up to the brain. Information, motor information from the brain comes down through these motor tracts and connects with neurons in the ventral horn or the anterior horn. This is where our motor cell bodies are. So we send information from the frontal lobe, our motor cortex. We've decided to pick up our phone and text, and now we have to contract those muscles. That information leaves through motor neurons that start in the ventral horn and go all the way out to the muscles. Autonomic nervous system information, the cell bodies are in the lateral horn, and then they also use these spinal nerves to send information out to the target tissues. So let's suppose you had a car accident and it damaged the dorsal or the posterior side of one of your spinal nerves, okay? Say it damaged the posterior root of a spinal nerve. Would that affect your sensory or your motor abilities. Okay, sensory information is always coming in the dorsal side. Motor information is always going out through the ventral or anterior side. The other thing that I wanted to cover is reflexes. Two kinds of reflexes, a monosynaptic and a polysynaptic. Reflexes are protective mechanisms. This allows our body to respond to a sensory stimulus without the requirement of our brain thinking and planning and wasting time coming up with a reaction. So sometimes we can have a reflex where our body just reacts and we don't have to think about it. The example for monosynaptic is the knee jerk reflex. Have you ever been to the doctor and they tap your leg and your leg contracts? Okay, so that's a monosynaptic reflex. If your nervous system is functioning properly, you can't control that reflex and your leg is going to extend. Okay, so what is happening? Over here, we have our patellar tendon. And when you hit this tendon, it causes this quadricep muscle to stretch. We have receptors called muscle spindles in our muscles that detect stretch. Our body wants to protect itself. We don't want to overstretch any muscle because it can damage and tear the muscle. When our muscle spindles detect stretch, in order to prevent overstretching, it will cause a contraction. What happens when you contract the quadriceps muscle? It's gonna make your leg move up and you're going to be extending your leg. Number one, we have a sensory receptor, in this case the muscle spindle, that is detecting sensory stimuli. In this case it is stretch. That sensory information is moving along afferent neurons and is going through, the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion, it's going into the dorsal or posterior side. That sensory information will immediately cause an action potential in a motor neuron. The motor neuron then moves down 
the efferent pathway and it will cause the effector, which is the quadriceps muscle, to contract. When it contracts, you move your leg. You will also send information to your brain. Your brain will know this happened, but your brain doesn't have to cause that effector muscle to contract. So when you have a monosynaptic reflex, there is only one synapse. The sensory neuron directly synapses onto a motor neuron and causes a reaction. The second type is a polysynaptic reflex, and this just means that there's going to be more than one synapse involved. So in a polysynaptic reflex, you're going to have the sensory information again is going to go to the spinal cord, but then it is going to synapse onto an interneuron, which then will synapse onto more than one motor neuron. A good example of a polysynaptic reflex is a withdrawal reflex. In this example, our stimulus is heat. Excessive heat, we are going to use a pain receptor. Um, extreme temperatures are detected by nociceptors that detect pain. You will also detect heat using your thermoreceptors. That sensory information, number one, sensory information is going to be detected by a specific receptor. Number two, your afferent sensory neuron is going to send that sensory information to the central nervous system, which is our integrating center. That sensory information goes in the posterior side into the posterior horn where there are synapses. So this is a polysynaptic reflex because there is more than one synapse. The information is going to first synapse on an interneuron, which will then synapse onto a motor neuron. When you contract your bicep muscle, for example, you have to relax the tricep, the antagonist muscle. So because acetylcholine is always excitatory. If acetylcholine is released on a muscle, it will cause contraction. So there are no inhibitory neurotransmitters for muscles. So the only way to inhibit muscle contraction is to inhibit it in the central nervous system by preventing an action potential from happening in a motor neuron. So when the motor neuron has no action potential, then that muscle it's innervating won't contract. So up here, we need to contract the biceps muscle. So we're going to send an EPSP or an excitatory neurotransmitter to stimulate this motor neuron, which will then cause the biceps muscle to contract. And then another synapse will prevent an action potential from happening. So this interneuron will release an IPSP which is inhibitory, and therefore there is no action potential happening in this motor neuron. Therefore, the tricep muscle will relax because there's no action potential in that motor neuron. And then when you contract the biceps and you relax the triceps, then you have your response, which is you move your hand away from the burning pot.